In this video, I'm going to reintroduce you to a lot of the techniques that you saw in some of your earlier finance classes. So we'll first go through some of the, the more basic models, the replacement cost or book value or asset value models. Uh, we'll go through the dividend discount model, market multiples, and then a single stage discounted cash flows model. And then I'll introduce a model that you very likely haven't seen before, the residual income model. And then finally, we'll wrap up this video with me discussing when to use each of these different models. Now, before I get into each of these models, I think it's important to talk about what we're looking for. So we're, all of these models are using fundamental analysis and fundamental analysis involves us using a firm's fundamentals. It's financial statements, it's net income, it's sales, anything on the financial statements to determine the true or intrinsic value of a particular security. And if we find that the intrinsic value of that particular security is greater than the current market value, we would want to buy that security. If we find that the intrinsic value is less than the market value, we would want to sell or if we don't own it, we would want to short that security. If we find that the intrinsic value is exactly equal to the market value, well, we'd want to recommend a hold. However, the likelihood that we find that the intrinsic value and the market value are equal is very, very low. So this is, we usually would want to assign a range. So if our intrinsic value is very close to our market value, then we might consider just holding the stock. Going along with the relationship between the intrinsic value and the market value, we can calculate a, an expected holding period return based on that information. So if our intrinsic value is greater than the market price, what this indicates is that over the next year, this asset should offer us a positive alpha. And the way we determine our expected holding period return is by taking our expected dividends on this security, let's say this stock over the next year, and adding to that the expected price at the end of the year, which is essentially our target price that you saw from your earlier finance classes. And that target price is going to be our intrinsic value times one plus your required return. And we're going to subtract from that the current price, and we're going to divide all of that by the current price. So the, the market price as of today. And that value or that formula will give us our expected holding period return over the next year. If our intrinsic value is greater than market price, we should receive a positive alpha and a fairly high holding period return. If it's less than market price, we should expect a negative alpha and a lower holding period return over the next year. All right, now it's time to talk about the valuation methods that I promised you were going to see. So the first method is the replacement cost method. And the replacement cost method, it has a couple of names. Besides this, uh, it's sometimes called the book value method, the asset value method. It's arguably one of the simpler approaches to valuation. And what we do is we calculate the liquidation value of the assets of the firm. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine how much we could sell each asset for fairly quickly. And the downside to this method is that it's, it's really only appropriate for firms that have assets that can be valued fairly quickly, fairly easily. Uh, so we're looking at firms that produce commodities or firms that own liquid securities. If the firm has any kind of intangibles, it's not going to be a good candidate for the replacement cost method. So this kind of narrows our, our universe of firms that we could use this method on to companies like banks, which have assets that are regularly, fairly easily priced by the market, fruit stands where we can value the pieces of fruit that are being sold and the wood that goes into the stand, uh, you get the idea. And what we're gonna do to calculate the equity value for a firm that we're using this method on is just take the, the replacement or liquidation cost of assets and subtract the total value of the liabilities. What's left is the intrinsic value of equity. Now going along with replacement cost is the idea of Tobin's Q. And Tobin's Q is essentially a, a ratio where we, we calculate the market value of both our debt and our equity, and we divide that by the book value of debt and equity. And what this will give us is something essentially are, are very similar to our market to book ratio, except we're, we're including all assets of the firm. 
It tells us how valuable the the assets of the firm are relative to their historical value. It's it's essentially a, a ratio of market price to, as I have here, replacement cost. The reason we care about Tobin's Q is because it essentially tells us the value added by the firm, or rather the firm's management. And theoretically, over the lifetime of the firm, the Q, or Tobin's Q, should average to one, although in the real world, really what we see is that most firms are going to have a Tobin's Q greater than one. The next group of models I need to discuss are dividend discount models. Dividend discount models involve us forecasting a firm's dividends off into the future and then discounting those future dividends back to the present at the required rate of return, also known as the market capitalization rate. What we'll be left with is the intrinsic value. Now, this type of model is particularly good for outside shareholders because the dividends represent really the, the only income you're going to get as a shareholder unless you sell your shares. So this is arguably very good for shareholders that invest in fairly mature firms that have a, a growth rate in dividends that's constantly growing, and you're not going to own a uh, majority stake of the company. Now, our market capitalization rate, or required rate of return, the way we calculate this is using the CAPM. So we take the risk-free rate, which is the yield on a treasury security, and we add to that the beta of the stock multiplied by the quantity of the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. Now, there are a couple of different types of dividend discount models. If we want to value a company that has zero growth in its dividends, we just divide the dividend by the, the market capitalization rate. But most firms that have dividends, we typically assume that they're going to grow those dividends over time. And so that's why we use the constant growth DDM. And this formula essentially forces us to take the dividend that was just paid and multiply that by one plus our dividend growth rate and divide all of that by the required return minus the growth rate. And we can also rearrange this so that our dividend that we expect a year from now is just divided by required return minus growth rate. So let's take a look at a couple of questions that will force us to use this formula. So in this example, Ford offers a 60 cent dividend this year. The firm's market cap rate is 7.8% and its dividend growth rate is 3%. How much should Ford's shares be worth? Well, we have a 60 cent dividend this year, so that indicates that the dividend was just paid. Anytime you see the word just paid or anything like that, that indicates it's D0. And we know our dividend growth rate that was given is 3% and our required return or market cap rate is 7.8%. So we should get an intrinsic value of 12.88 or something that would round to 12.88. Now, one obvious question arises, how do we estimate the growth rate in dividends? Now, you can always read through the MD&A statement in the 10K or try to make your own best estimate, but there is a formula that is out there that we can use to estimate the growth rate in dividends, and that's just our return on equity times the plowback ratio, or what's also known as the retention ratio. And the retention ratio, or plowback ratio, is just one minus the percentage of earnings that's getting paid out in the form of dividends. So one minus the dividends per share divided by earnings per share. So let's try a, uh, an example that's slightly more complicated. So you're trying to value Sony and you know the firm's beta is 1.5. You know the risk-free rate is 1.5% and the market risk premium will be 6%. Sony's ROE is 14% and the firm's dividend payout ratio is 80%. The firm's current dividend per share is 350 use the DDM to calculate the intrinsic value. We know enough to be able to calculate the required rate of return. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the risk-free rate of 1.5% and add to that the quantity of our beta times the market risk premium for a required return of 10.5%. Next, we need our dividend growth rate. And we're going to use that formula I just gave you. It's our ROE times one minus the dividends per share divided by earnings per share. And since we know our, our dividends per share divided by earnings per share, also known as the dividend payout ratio is 
one minus that is 20%. So our growth rate in dividends is 2.8%. And then finally, we just plug this in. We know our, our current dividend or the dividend that was just paid is $3.50 plus 1.028 divided by 0 0.105 minus 0 0.028 gives us a an intrinsic value of about 46.73. All right. Good things come in threes, so I thought I'd just throw one more example that's slightly more complicated to completely refresh your memory on this stuff. So in this final example using the DDM, a stock is currently selling for $15 a share. The firm's earnings per share in the next year are expected to be a dollar, and the firm is expected to pay out 50% of its earnings in the form of a dividend. ROE is 12%, the yield on the T-bill is 2%, risk premium is 6%, and the beta is 1.3%. What is the intrinsic value per share? Well, in this case, again, we're going to need to know our plowback ratio. And since our dividend payout ratio was 0.5, our plowback ratio is also going to be 0.5. Next, we take our ROE, which was given as 12%, and multiply that by the plowback ratio, and that gives us a growth rate in dividends of 6%. We'll also need our required return, and we were given that the risk-free rate was 2%, our beta is 1.3, and our market risk premium, again in this problem, was 6%, so our required return was 9.8%. Lastly, we plug this information in. So our dividend per share was 50 cents. Our one plus our growth rate in dividends is 1.06. And then 0.098 minus 0.06 gives us an intrinsic value of 13.95. So we know the current share price of the stock is $15. And so since the intrinsic value is less than $15, we would generally like to recommend a sell in this case. Now, there's a couple of remaining facts and issues that I, I always feel like I should discuss with the DDM. First, it's important to understand what drives the intrinsic value in the DDM. Well, if the dividend is large, that means that your intrinsic value is going to be large. If your market cap rate is relatively small, then your denominator is also going to be small because your denominator is just R minus G. And then finally, if your growth rate of dividends is very high, well, if again, your denominator is R minus G, so that would decrease your denominator and thus increase the, the intrinsic value of your stock. There are a couple of problems with the DDM, but the biggest one is that it's actually not that good at valuing individual stocks. And this is because we're assuming a constant growth rate, but in reality, in the real world, that's very unlikely. Companies tend to increase dividends, not necessarily by a certain amount every single quarter. And some companies, they might increase their dividend by five cents this year. They might have a special dividend next year. It's, it's not a constant growth rate. So the primary way that we use D the DDM is as a, a backup or a very quick estimation of what that stock could be worth, or we use it in conjunction with other models. So as we get into the two-stage models, we, we often like to use the, the DDM or the, this model that assumes constant growth to estimate the terminal value of a particular security. The next method I need to discuss is the market multiples method. And the market multiples method involves us taking the valuation ratio of a firm's competitor and copying it onto our target firm or the firm that we're trying to value. Now, the reason we do this is because valuation ratios essentially account for the possible growth prospects of a company. So valuation ratios like the trailing PE ratio, the forward PE ratio, the price to sales ratio, the price to cash flow ratio, all of these are very, very popular ratios to use in the market multiples method. So how do we use this process? Well, it's fairly straightforward. We take a firm, a target firm that we want to value, 
and we need to identify the closest possible competitor to our firm. So if we're talking about Lyft, we'd want to use Uber. If we're talking about GM, maybe our closest competitor is Ford. Either way, we need a direct, very close competitor that operates in the same markets, in the same industry. If we don't have a good competitor, this is probably not the best method. So once we've identified a good competitor, we next need to identify the multiple of the competitor that we want to use. So is it the PE ratio? Is it the price to sales ratio? What is it? And we'll take that ratio and multiply it by our target firm's metric. So let's say we want to use the PE ratio or rather the trailing PE ratio. We're going to take our competitors trailing PE ratio and we're going to multiply that by our target firm's earnings per share. And if this is the trailing PE ratio, this would be the, the earnings per share of our target firm over the last 12 months. So really what we're doing is we're taking this, this valuation ratio, which is essentially a proxy for growth prospects, and copying it onto our target firm, which has a certain earnings per share. And that's going to give us our intrinsic value. Now, there are a lot of issues with market multiples. First off, the accounting decisions made by a firm are going to affect the, the ratios, the market multiples ratios. So, for example, what decisions did the firm's accountants make that determined earnings per share? Are they using certain accounting systems, LIFO versus FIFO, that might affect the, the earnings per share? If so, you know that, that could cause issues with our, our valuation. Second, there could be issues involving the business cycle. So let's say we have the earnings per share of our target firm and the earnings per share is over, let's say, April through the previous May. Well, if we're using a valuation ratio of our competitor firm that has, oh, let's say, earnings per share that stopped in June, well, it might be the case that the market turned around in that period between April and June. And maybe we were in an expansionary period in April and then it turned around and we're turns out we find out later we're in a recessionary period in those those next two months. It's possible, but uh, the bigger issue here is that we if we're using annual earnings per share, we could have different fiscal year ends, which could cause issues when we're using the the market multiples. You know, one firm might have a different fiscal year end than another firm. And also, in many cases, a lot of our ratios are going to be negative. And that's especially true if our earnings per share of our, our competitor firm is, are less than zero. So let's say our, our competitor is, oh, GameStop. And GameStop has a negative earnings per share and that would mean that its P.E. ratio, if we actually reported the actual number, it would be negative. But we usually just blank that out or report an N.A. or just put a dash there. So this is an issue when you use market multiples. And usually the way we handle this is we use the price to cash flow ratio or even better, the price to sales ratio when we're valuing companies that have negative earnings per share. Now to give you a sense of why we like to use industry pairs when we use the market multiples approach, I pulled some PE ratios for different industries from Professor Demoderan out of New York, uh, NYU's personal website. And so here we can see that very clearly the average PE ratio differs across industry. So for auto and truck manufacturers, we have a very high PE ratio given right now we're going through a period where semiconductors are hard to get, earnings per share are, I believe, uh, slightly down, that depresses PE ratio. Uh, tra air transport prices are depressed, and so we have a, a very low PE ratio for a lot of industry competitors. And then if you look at some industries, like uh, the brokerage industry, the cable, TV industry, uh, you do see some fairly high PE ratios. So what this information tells us is that some of these industries, like the brokerage industry, the cable TV industry, the uh, auto and truck industry, investors are willing to pay more for every dollar of historical earnings per share over the last 12 months. Uh, these industries, we would say that they're more highly valued.
than other firms in other industries with a uh, lower average trailing PE ratio. The next method I need to discuss is the residual income method. Now, residual income can be thought of as the gap between net income of a particular firm and the opportunity cost of capital. And the way we typically calculate our residual income, or RI sub T, is by taking our net income in a certain time period and subtracting from that the product of our required return minus our book value or our book equity at the start of the year or at the end of the previous year. So book equity at the end of the previous year is going to be exactly the same as the book equity at the start of the year. And what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these residual incomes that we estimate, say, next year, the year after that, the year after that, and so on and so forth, discount them to the present using our required return, add in the current book price or the book price at the start of the period, and that's going to give us our intrinsic value. And if we want, we can even use a formula very much like the we did with the DDM and assume that our residual income is growing at a set rate through time. And so what we do is we take the book equity at the start of the period plus our ROE minus our required return, all that times the, the start starting book equity divided by the quantity of required return minus the growth rate. That'll give us our intrinsic value. So let's take a look at a very quick example to illustrate the residual income model. So let's say you believe a firm will maintain a 15% ROE over the next three years, and the firm's required return is 12%, and the firm's book equity is currently $12 a share. If the firm has no residual income after these three years, what is the intrinsic value? Okay, so we start with the book equity that we know. Right now, it's given as $12. So the current book equity, or B at time period zero, or at the end of B sub T minus one is $12. We know our ROE is always going to be 12, 15%. And what we can do is we can calculate our earnings per share by using the 15% ROE and multiplying it by our book equity at the start of the period. So $12 times 15% ROE gives us earnings per earnings of $1.80. And our equity charge, our opportunity cost of equity, is going to be our required return minus that same $12. And our required return on equity was given as 12%. So we take that 12% multiplied by $12, and that's where we get this $1.44. And the gap between the 180 and the 144, that's going to be our residual income for the period. In this case, it's 36 cents. And then our ending book value is just our starting book value, plus any retained earnings that we received uh, this period. So $12 plus 180, and theoretically, if we paid out any dividends, we'd have to subtract that, but we're assuming no dividends here. So our ending book value would be $13.80. And that ending book value in year one is also our starting book value in year two. And then we just repeat the process. So our earnings in year two are just $13.80 times 15%, or 2.07. Our equity charge is our required rate of return of 12% multiplied by $13.80, so 166. Our residual income is the gap between our earnings during the period and our equity charge. Okay, so 41 cents, just 207 minus 166. And then our ending book value is just our beginning book value, plus our earnings. So 1380 plus 207 gives us 1587. And that'll be carried forward to the start of year three. And our ROE, again, 15%. So our earnings are just 15% times 1587. Our equity charge is 12% times 1587. Our residual income is the gap between the earnings and the equity charge. So 238 minus 190 or 48 cents, and then our ending book value would be just the, the 1587 plus our earnings. But we, at the very end, we don't receive any 
any additional residual income. So our intrinsic value here would be our, our initial book value plus our discounted residual income for all three periods. So 36 cents divided by one plus our return on equity to the first and then so on and so forth. And that should give us about 12.99. Now, just like the dividend discount model, we can estimate a growth rate, and we do it the same way we do with the DDM. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our dividend payout ratio, or the DPS divided by earnings per share, and subtract that from 1, and that'll give us our retention ratio, and we're going to multiply that by our return on equity. So let's take a look at another example. We're, we're trying to value a small publicly traded U.S. firm, and we expect the firm to maintain a 20% ROE and 8% required return. The firm's book price per share is $32, and we expect the firm's dividend payout ratio to be 75%. Calculate the intrinsic value using an RI model. Okay, first things first, let's get our G. Well, we know that the dividend payout ratio is 75%, so 1 minus that is going to be our plowback ratio. And we're going to take that plowback ratio of 25%, multiply it by our ROE, which is 20%, and that gives us our growth rate in residual income, so 5 cents. Next, we know our book equity, that's just $32, and we know our everything else, really. So we take 32 plus the quantity of 20 percent minus 8 percent times our book equity of again 32 and we divide all of that by our 8 percent required return minus the growth rate and we get our intrinsic value of 160 dollars a share okay so now let's talk about the pros and cons to the ri method now the first pro of using the residual income method is that Unlike a free cash flow model where the intrinsic value is dominated by the terminal value, with the RI method, the majority of the value of your particular equity that you're valuing is going to come in the initial period from that book equity. The next pro to using the RI method is that, well, you're, you're using accounting data. You're using the book equity off the balance sheet, and you can usually forecast ROE pretty easily. You'll have historical ROE, and you'll also be able to forecast the required return using the CAPM. So you have all the necessary components here, which is pretty nice. This method is also very useful when, let's say, your firm isn't paying out a dividend or its cash flows are negative. So let's say you're, you're valuing a firm that just undertook an IPO, or let's say it's had a, a period of poor performance and it hasn't had positive free cash flows for a while. Well, you might not be able to use the DDM or the free cash flow method, but you can use the residual income method. And then finally, your RI method is, it's gonna rely on that gap between earnings and the opportunity cost, or rather the, the cost of equity. And so that gap, it's, it's essentially an, an economic profit, not an actual accounting profit. Now, there are some pretty big drawbacks to using the residual income method. And the first is the same issue we have with any method that uses any kind of accounting data, and that is that the accounting data can be manipulated. So I'm certain you've heard about earnings management in prior classes. Different accounting choices could be used to adjust earnings per share, which would affect ROE. Uh, so this is a pretty big issue with the RI method because, you know, we're getting a lot of our, our data for this particular model from the balance sheet and the income statement. So, you know, ROE is just net income divided by shareholders' equity. Now, the other big con is that we're assuming that something called the clean surplus relation holds. And the clean surplus relation essentially says that our next period book equity or shareholders equity is going to be equal to the previous year's or previous period's book equity plus the earnings or net income minus the dividends. So what this says is that there's nothing else that's going to affect the book equity of our firm which is not always realistic. And the reason this 
isn't realistic for a lot of firms is because a lot of firms, if they operate internationally, yeah, they might have the US dollar as their, their primary currency for the, the parent company. But let's say they operate in a country like Japan, where the, the local currency is the yen. Well, if they're making sales in yen, they're going to have to convert that yen back into U.S. dollars. And the issue with that is that, well, when do you recognize that conversion? Do we say that they we need to convert those yen into dollars at the end of the period? Do we say that we use the exchange rate that is the average of that period? The issue that this creates is that we have to include a currency translation adjustment. And we report that, or we, we include that in the shareholder's equity. And so what I'm trying to convey here is something that is a pretty big ish issue for any multinational firm. Essentially, if they're doing, if they're making transactions in multiple currencies, then when they convert the, the local currency where they're selling their products back into US dollars, it could be the case that there there's a, a currency translation issue between the, the balance sheet and the the profit that they're reporting. And so uh, that gap is going to be the the CTA, the, the currency translation adjustment. That would violate the, the clean surplus relation. And there's a lot of other factors that could violate the current the clean surplus relation, but that's arguably the biggest. And so what I'm trying to convey here is if your firm that you're trying to value as an international firm and it operates in countries that whose cur currency is not the US dollar, but the parent company does use US dollars, chances are this, this clean surplus relation is not going to hold. All right, so when should you use these RI models? Well, these models do a pretty good job of taking the place of the dividend discount models because in the dividend discount model, well, quite frankly, if your firm doesn't pay dividends, the model doesn't work. It's going to report a, a, a an intrinsic value of zero. Next, your firm, if it has negative cash flow, you can't use the free cash flow method, or you could if you assume that at some point in the not-too-distant future, it's going to have positive free cash flow. But that's not the case for every firm that has current negative cash flow. And then finally, the terminal value growth, if it's uncertain, then that could be a pretty pretty big issue when you're valuing the firm. Because in the free cash flow method, that terminal value can represent 60, 70, 80 percent of the total value of the firm. But with the RI method, the majority of the value is coming up front as of today. You shouldn't use this RI method when there's any kind of uncertainty about future return on equity. If you don't know what the ROE is going to be, let's say, a year from now or two years from now, it's best to just avoid the RI method because the ROE is essentially one of the primary components to this method. And second, like I just described, the clean surplus relation, if it gets violated, essentially you, you would want to avoid this method. So if your firm operates internationally and uh, uses multiple currencies, that would be a good example of when that, that clean surplus violation violation is going to occur. The last type of models I want to discuss in this video are single stage free cash flow models. And the single stage free cash flow models are also known as discounted cash flow models. And we estimate either the free cash flows to equity or the free cash flows to the firm. And what we're going to do is we're going to treat them very much like we did with the, the constant growth dividend discount model, where we plug in our free cash flow to the firm right now and assume that free cash flow grows at a current rate, or we plug in our free cash flow to equity at time period zero today and assume that that grows at a constant rate G. Now notice here the big difference besides the free cash flows. With the free cash flows to the firm, we're discounting that or we're, we're dividing all of our numerator by the weighted average cost of capital minus the growth rate because this is the free cash flows to the end entire firm, we need a discount rate that accounts for all of the cost, all the sources of the capital. So the debt, the preferred stock, the equity of the firm. With the free cash flows to equity method, we're using the required rate of return or the, the CAPM. 
So let's go through all of the various formulas we have for calculating the free cash flows to the firm. There are a couple. Some are going to be more useful in certain situations just because it might be difficult for certain firms. Maybe you, you don't see, oh, one of the metrics here. Maybe you you know, it's a hard, hard, hard time finding the uh, statement of cash flows or you only have the balance sheet and the income statement and so you want to use one of these first three. Maybe your firm reports EBIT but not EBITDA. So some of these formulas are going to be more useful in certain time periods or when you're looking at certain firms depending on exactly what they report on the income statement. So your free cash flow to the firm, one of the most basic formulas is just going to be your EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes, also thought of as the operating income times one minus your corporate tax rate. And we'll take that, we'll add to that our depreciation expense on the income statement. And the reason we add this in is because depreciation expense is a, well, it's a non-cash expense. So we add in any non-cash expenses. Uh, we're going to just assume for the most part that the depreciation is the only non-cash expense. Uh, and then we'll subtract from that any increases in PPE or CapEx and also subtract any changes to net working capital. So current assets minus current liabilities. There are some other formulas here. So in this next one, we use net income plus depreciation plus the interest rate on interest expense times one minus the tax rate minus our changes in PPE and net working capital. And then we have two others. One of them uses the cash flow from operations or operating cash flow. And we add to that our interest expense times one minus our tax rate. And then we subtract our change in PPE. Now, our discount rate for the free cash flows to the firm is going to be the weighted average cost of capital. And to get our weighted average cost of capital, what we're going to do is we're going to take the weight of debt as a portion of total firm capital. And we're going to multiply that by the cost of debt, the pre-tax cost of debt times one minus the marginal tax rate or the corporate tax rate. And the reason we do this is because debt is uh, tax deductible. If you make a an interest payment, that decreases your, your potential tax burden. And we're going to add to all of this the weight of equity times the return on equity or the required return. And this is also our, our, mar our market cap rate. For the free cash flow to equity, we have a couple of other formulas. So if we already know our free cash flow to the firm, what we can do is we can take our interest expense, multiply that by one minus our marginal tax rate, and then add to that the change in debt. So the reason we do that is, let's say we borrowed some money. That, that money that we borrowed, that's essentially a cash inflow for the equity holders, the, the stockholders. And so that increases our free cash flow to uh, the shareholders. So that, that's why we add that change. We can also calculate FCFE as net income plus depreciation minus our PPE minus our net change in PPE minus our networking capital, and then plus that, that increase in the debt. And then finally, if we really want to forecast free cash flow to equity, we'll use our net income minus one minus our, our target debt to assets ratio times the change in PPE minus the depreciation and all of that minus one minus our, one minus our target debt ratio times our change in net working capital. Any of these is going to be just fine, uh, depending on what your firm provides. Some of these are going to be easier to use than others. All right, so now I need to add a couple of final statements about DCF or free cash flow valuation. First off, if we're trying to calculate a long-term growth rate for the free cash flow to the firm or free cash flow to the equity, a lot of times the best growth rate is going to be the GDP growth in whatever economy we're talking about. So if it's the U.S., 2%, uh, maybe 2.5% is going to be a pretty good growth rate or the one, it's often the one that I use in my models. Uh, next, our changes in CapEx and networking capital are not going to be smooth. So once we do start to use multi-stage models, this is going to be a pretty big issue. 
uh, we'll, we'll need to adjust for that. We might need to make changes based on what we read in the, the MDNA statement of the 10K. Uh, so we'll account for possible changes three years out or five years out that we, we won't expect to see this year. Next, sometimes on a firm's income statement, rather than seeing EBIT, it, EBIT will be referred to as operating income. They mean the, the exact same thing. Also, our average tax rate is going to be a, a pretty good estimate of our future tax rate. If a firm is, let's say they're generating a similar amount of earnings year over year, chances are that tax rate is going to be pretty consistent year over year. And so this is one of those cases where we can use the, uh, the past tax rate as a pretty good predictor of the firm's future tax rate. Uh, we also, as we get more complicated with these free cash flows, free cash flow models, we are going to want to make some very, very simplifying assumptions. Uh, you're going to see that a lot more with the, the multi-stage models that we'll do later on. And then finally, the growth rate and some of these other components that they're, they're really hard to pin down. So for a lot of these free cash flow or discounted cash flow models, we do want to use some sensitivity analysis or maybe a Monte Carlo simulation to essentially account for the variability or the fact that our inputs that we use in the model are just not accurate. We, we want to get a range. So now that I've discussed a lot of the more simple models that we often like to use in valuation, it's time to discuss when we want to use each of these models, because there's some time periods and some firms where we would want to use one model, but not another model. So to get us started, let's go back to the replacement cost model. Now, with the replacement cost model, we typically would want to use that for equities or firms where there's just no tangible assets. So again, think banks or any very, very simple firm where all of their assets are tangible, touchable, maybe groceries or lumber or some kind of commodity. Next, we have the dividend discount model. And the dividend discount model, the issue that we have with that is we, we're assuming that that growth rate in the dividend is constant through time, let's say 2% a year. That's not really realistic for most firms. I mean, the only firms for which that would apply maybe would be a, a very blue chip company that has consistently, consistently increased its dividends at that rate. And this is really best suited for a mature firm, and it's best suited for outside shareholders or minority shareholders. And the reason for this is that those minority shareholders, the primary form of compensation for them is the dividend. They're not going to be able to influence, let's say, the, the firm's corporate policy, uh, their financial policy, anything like that. They basically just collect dividends. And we often expect that the, the volatility of the cash flows of that firm are going to be fairly low. Uh, that's, that's why the firm is able to pay a, a fairly consistent dividend. Next, we have the discounted cash flows models or free cash flows models. With the single stage model, it's just like the DDM. We assume constant growth, and this model could work even if we don't have dividends because we could have positive free cash flows. The difficulty here is that well, there are going to be firms that have very low free cash flows, maybe negative free cash flows. And if we have some volatility in those free cash flows, well, we're assuming with this single stage discounted cash flows model that, that those free cash flows are growing at a, co a constant rate. So if there's any volatility, anything but a, a consistent increase in the free cash flows, this model is not going to be appropriate. Next, we have the market multiples approach. And here, this model is pretty flexible, especially for cases where we can't accurately estimate future cash flows, future dividends, future residual income. This model is best suited for tech firms, IPO firms, any firm for which future cash flows are going to be a problem. Next, we could have something like a two stage or a three stage cash flow model or a discounted cash flows model there we might actually be able to account for volatility and if we do see let's say a, a firm with let's say five years of 
different free cash flows. And then after that fifth year, we see a constant increase in the free cash flow. This would be a case where we could use a, a two-stage discounted cash flows model to value that firm. For a lot of the firms that are on the S&P 500, this would arguably be a, a fairly decent model because we, we generally assume that after a certain amount of time, those free cash flows are going to start to grow at a, a fairly constant rate that's consistent with the long-term growth of the U.S. economy. And so this would be fairly appropriate. We could even have a three-stage discounted cash flows model, and that would be appropriate for cases where we have maybe the next two or three years we have very fast cash flow growth, and then the next couple of years we see a lower level of cash flow growth, and then after that our our cash flow growth over the next, well, hundred or infinite many of many years, the cash flow growth is just constant at 2%, 2.5%, whatever the long-term growth rate of the economy is. So that's when we want to use these models. These are typically for firms that expect to see a higher cash flow growth rate in the immediate or next five years, and then that cash flow growth rate falls off to a, a certain level. And lastly, the residual income model. And this is best for firms that really don't have any international operations, so U.S. firms that have fairly simple operations where we can estimate that residual income. So I thought it'd be a good idea to also briefly go over the, the pros and cons of each of these models. So the replacement cost method, it's simple. It's easy. If we have, let's say, very marketable assets and the firm is only holding marketable assets and maybe very few fixed assets, it's going to be very easy to value that firm, and that that is the benefit of the replacement cost model. The downside there is that if there's any intangible assets, it's going to be really hard to value those because we don't have a good market assessment of what those those intangible assets are going to be worth, and so that makes it very difficult to use this model. Next, the DDM. The benefit here is that it's incredibly simple. So the model that I'm referring to here is the, the constant growth DDM. Very simple. It's something that you can do on the back of a, a nap, well, a napkin or the back of a notebook or something like that. Uh, the downside here is that it does assume constant growth and it does require to have positive dividends, which are not realistic for most firms. Next, we have the single stage discounted cash flows model. There, it's fairly simple. It's We're just assuming a constant growth rate. The downside there, again, is that it requires positive cash flow. Market multiples, we assume that we don't need to know the cash flows. We just need to have a comparable firm. And that's the big hiccup in the market multiples approach. It's that we require a very, very comparable firm that has some valuation ratios available. So it's publicly traded and its operations are very, very similar to our target firm that we're trying to value. And that's not always realistic, especially for, let's say, a conglomerate where there's just no good competitor firm out there. Next, we do have cases where we could have two-stage or three-stage discounted cash flows models. Those are pretty flexible. They allow us to adjust the dividend, or sorry, the cash flows for the next couple of years before the cash flow growth rate falls to a, a consistent rate. The downside there is that we're assuming that after five years or maybe uh, less time than that or more time than that, the cash flow growth rate does stabilize. It does fall to the long-term growth rate in the U.S. economy. We're going to spend a lot more time on that in a later video. And then finally, the residual income models. Those are fairly flexible. They the benefit here is that unlike the free cash flows or discounted cash flows models where you have the majority of the value coming in the terminal value period, uh, with the residual income model, the majority of the value of the asset or the, the stock is coming in the immediate period, and then you, you know, you're, you're collecting residual income over the next several periods. The downside here, and it's a fairly big downside, especially if you're trying to value a very big multinational that operates across, let's say, 50 countries and receives a, I don't know, half its revenue from countries 
where sales are denominated in something besides the U.S. dollar, that clean surplus relation is going to be violated, and that's that's a case where you'd really not want to use that that model. All right, so to summarize, some models are just not appropriate for some firms. You need to know what model would be appropriate for your firm, although there are cases where you want to use several different models. I mean, when I do evaluation, I, I try to use every model that I possibly can. That way I, I kind of know what the range is. And then I also know which model is most appropriate for this firm. Is, is it a tech firm? Well, it's probably market multiples. Is it a bank? Well, replacement cost. Is it a company like IBM where it's fairly mature? Well, there it might be the two-stage discounted cash flows method. So knowing the type of firm, the firm uh, the industry in which it operates, the outlook of the firm in terms of cash flow, dividends, etc., is going to determine which models are going to be most appropriate for your firm. And then uh, finally, you should be pre pre prepared to perform some additional analysis. Although I didn't go into it that much in this video, uh, after we calculate the intrinsic value, that's when it's time to start to perform something like scenario analysis, sensitivity analysis, Monte Carlo simulation. Essentially, we want to double check that if we make some small changes to our valuation, our our intrinsic value isn't just going to get thrown out of whack. We want to see some consistency in our intrinsic value. We want to make sure that that intrinsic value is not going to all of a sudden go from much higher than our, our current market price to much lower than our market price. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up this video. If you have any questions, obviously, please feel free to reach out to me at any time.